again, just to uh, introduce who we have coming up to talk to you about this pilot is Peter Ernest, the Executive Director of the International Spy Museum, and he himself is a 36-year veteran of the clandestine service for the CIA. We also have Major General Oleg Kalugin, retired of the KGB. And finally, Dr. Mark Stout, who himself was a analyst in the CIA, I see, and a, uh, and a historian here at the Spy Museum before me tonight as well. Uh, we're delighted also, nice to see you coming in, to be joined tonight by one of the stars of Allegiance, the show you just saw, Alexandra Peters, who plays the O'Connor's youngest daughter, Sarah. <laughs> Alex is here tonight. And Mark is dropping stuff. Uh, <laughs> so the way this will work is uh, I will moderate to the degree that I will be asking some pointed questions to our panelists, kind of to try to get at uh, you know the realism behind this episode, uh, to try to find out uh, what they got right. And I think there's a lot here that they got right. And we have several different people, obviously, with different backgrounds. We have the analysts. We have the operations side. And of course, we have the Soviet and Russian side. Um, you couldn't have picked a better time to pilot a show about Russian spies in New York City. Um, I assume NBC has a gift basket being sent to the FBI as we speak uh, for, for arresting uh, Russian spies yesterday. So certainly, this is topical. Um, but what's really interesting about this show, I think, and the first question I'm going to point to Mark, is that uh, it is about the very glamorous and sexy world of intelligence analysis. Uh, most of the shows you may see are about operations, about the James Bonds, the spies running around. But here the main character is an analyst. Uh, and you were about his age when you started as an analyst for CIA. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about, is this show true to form of, of the experience of young analysts at CIA? Well, uh, is this on? Uh, first of all, let me just say that I think it's about time that we had a show about <laughs> analysts. Uh, and the other thing I'd comment on that struck me as extremely uh, realistic, uh, because I've done it many times, is that conversation that Alex had with his uh, younger sister about, uh, so what's it like to be a spy? And he says, I'm not a spy, I'm, I'm an analyst. And she says, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I've had that conversation so many times, because outsiders don't get it. Um, but I think it's, I think it's uh, I, I, Alex strikes me as in a lot of ways very realistic. He's a little more of a walking encyclopedia than most of us analysts are. We, 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 we like to think we're the smartest people in the room, but we're not that smart. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, he's somebody who lives off of his brain, um, who lives off of his um, intellect, and um, I, th I, I see in him a sense that I, that I see in all good intelligence analysts of whatever it is they're assigned to, whatever topic they're supposed to be working on, it is the most interesting and important thing in the entire world. And they will spend every waking minute, not only at work, but elsewhere, thinking about it, reading about it, uh, learning about it. Um, so I think that's very realistic. And just in a couple of sort of micro uh, sort of points, uh, he works in the Counterintelligence Center. There are indeed analysts who work in CIA's Counterintelligence Center. Most of the people that's in the Counterintelligence Center are, are uh, you know, on the operations side. Uh, but they do have, have analysts there. Um, and I guess the other thing I'd say, and, and, and you know, maybe this is, uh, maybe Peter will have some thoughts on this, but um, uh, you know, this, it's very common in the CIA uh, when you have a, a difficult problem, something you don't quite understand or you're not sure you're getting it right, to bring in somebody with a, you know, who's, who's fresh to the topic, has a new perspective on it. I, I, I like that. But when it comes to things that are, um, dominated, if you will, by the operations folks. The analysts always feel like they're there on sufferance, right? And you saw this with the New York uh, station chief, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, kids, stay out of the way. You obviously don't know what the heck you're doing. I wish you weren't even here. That's kind of a thing that, that you know, people on, on, on my side of the fence in, 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 in the agency and the intelligence community often have to deal with from people on, you know, who are on Peter's side of the, of the fence as well. They're, uh, we each kind of look down on each other in different ways. They, th they think we're bumbling, sort of practically incompetent people, and we think they're, you know, hopelessly uh, knuckle-dragging, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I would say that it's not unusual to find the occasional anal analyst who's lacking in social graces. As that, sadly, is true. <laughs> so, that's a good segue. Sorry. Peter, <laughs> let me ask you the next question. I, I think 
I mean, we talk a lot in the Spy Museum about how popular culture has portrayed espionage, uh, and of course, Bond and everything else. Y you do get a lot of times where we cringe at some of the terminology and things they're throwing out. It's, I think it's the way that doctors look at the medical shows, and when they're throwing out just random facts and terminology, it, it, doctors don't like that. In this case, they actually use some pretty realistic terminology. That the the vocabulary, things like dangle and talking about like a you know a, a, the 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 kind of operations they're running and the kind of conversation they're having, uh, to me seem pretty true to form. On the operation side, and and, and from what you saw, uh, are they closer than all theirs have been in the past? Um, no, I would say that uh, one of the things I found. <clears throat> quite realistic about the show uh, was despite what the media often says, the very close cooperation between the CIA and the FBI. Uh, that was an area of my responsibility was operations against Soviets and East Europeans in the United States. And I worked very closely with the Bureau. <clears throat> and you know, clearly there were turf differences, there were personality differences and so forth. But I didn't find that off-putting at all. I also thought that the terminology like Dangle uh, is dead on. I mean, that's certainly the terminology we used uh, again and again for sort of a, a bait kind of operation, sending someone in hoping they'd be recruited and run, and then that gives us an insight into the opposition's modus operandi and what their requirements are. So, Oleg, uh, these people who are uh, in the United States, deep undercover, uh, as part of what we can sell the illegals program, at least the Russians call it the illegals program. Um, conventional wisdom says that this is so secretive that there are people within SVR that don't even know who these actual operatives are in the United States. And that was all true, again, under the Soviet system that you were involved in. I is that urban legend or is there realism to the fact that this is like the most top secret program you could possibly have within Russian intelligence? Well, absolutely right. Well, I worked in the KGB for decades, and uh, I never knew what the illegals are doing. I was not supposed to. They were totally separated, autonomous, and no one would ask questions because that would be indiscreet. People would say, well, why the hell is he asking questions? They are illegals. Well, the guy by name Abel, or Abel, whatever, uh, he worked in the United States for many years. Rudolf Abel, yeah. And uh, I never heard of him, though I spent, uh, well, a third of my career in the United States, I mean, uh, intelligence yeah, working against, or in the United States against the United States. And at one point, I met Abel uh, live. That was in the dining room of the KGB headquarters. And I was just accidentally placed I mean, to, next to him. And I thought, I saw this man somewhere. And then it, I said, I'm sorry, I saw you somewhere. Oh, probably I saw you too. I say, where did you see me? Well, on the screen. I say, where did I see you? Well, may I introduce me? OK. Then he said, my name is Abel, or Abel. Well, I was amazed. I was really, it was something. I spent so many years, I say, in the United States running all sorts of operations. Um, and yet I never knew about the illegals. That was outside. Well, and even I, if I asked questions, I would be looked at with some uh, suspicion. Why? Well, he wants to know something. That's none of his business. And this separation from the KGB structure overall, I mean, of the illegals, that would make the Russian illegals, well, in some way successful, though in the long run the Soviet system fell apart anyway. <laughs> So, so, Mark, let me let me bring you in about talking about Russian analysis in particular, because you were a Russian analyst at, at CIA, and there's a plot point uh, at the beginning of this episode where uh, they claim that everybody at SVR who works in the United States knows all the Russian analysts that work against them in counterintelligence, and vice versa. Uh, is this consistent with your experiences? Uh, well, I think there's a substantial kernel of truth to that, at any rate. I mean, certainly the the Soviets and then the Russians uh, spent a lot of effort trying to figure out, uh, you know, who, who was at CIA and vice versa. Uh, but I do recall um, that uh, for for many years at the CIA, it was it was standard practice for a very long time that when analysts would write papers, and we saw a reference there to Alex having written a, a research paper on, I guess, a, a financial uh, crisis of some sort. Um, when analysts would write papers, the names of those analysts, the names of the authors, would be on those papers that would be uh, uh, that would be. Uh, published in a classified sense. 
until um, Aldrich James came along. And Ames spied, as you probably all know, for quite a number of years for the Soviets and then also for Russia. And among the things that he passed were not only operational secrets, I would note that Ames was, a, was an operations guy, not an analyst, uh, but he also, uh, he, he also passed analytic papers uh, to Moscow. And so Moscow was able to build up a huge uh, you know, uh, dossier, like they knew the names of most of the analysts working on Russia. And that is why no longer do does the agency put the name of names of analysts on papers for that sort of reason. So yeah, they're watching us and we're watching them. And I doubt that you know either side has the kind of total knowledge that maybe is suggested in the in the show. But there's more than a little a uh, little truth to that. So P Peter, as as an operations guy, I want to ask you a question that I think uh, rings true certainly in this episode. But I want to get your opinion on it, um, Alex the main character of the show would be a pretty big get if the SVR was able to recruit him, or in this case, as it looks like at the end of the show, they're going to try to spy on him. As an operations person, you were overseas recruiting agents from foreign, foreign governments or foreigners. Is this somebody that you would drool over targeting, somebody with the kind of access? You talk a lot about you want people with access. Having somebody at at levels of CIA that would have the kind of access that Alex would, would be a huge accomplishment for the SVR. Well, sure it would. Um, <clears throat> you, you, uh, the mere fact that someone is new, as he was, and he was in training, just having access to the building, I mean, look at the degree of access Snowden had. Uh, <clears throat> and he was a relatively new employee where he finally ended up, which was Booz Allen. Um, <clears throat> it is amazing how much information uh, can be gleaned by someone inside the organization. And today with computers and people who are capable of hacking into them, uh, that's even more so. Yeah, if I could just throw in something else on, on that as well, is that uh, you know, from, from, a, from an adversary's point of view, that recruiting an analyst would be, I, I believe, tremendously valuable, but it would provide you something slightly different from recruiting an operations officer. Analysts will not typically um, have the kind of deep insight into the CIA's operations, like exactly who they're recruiting and who their mm -hmm. case officers overseas and which locations might be and that sort of thing. They'll have some knowledge of that and they'll know things that might help, you know, people investigating it figured out. But analysts will also have much broader knowledge about government secrets than typically operations folks will. Um, they're, much, they're likely to know much more about, say, signals intelligence or satellite reconnaissance or about the kind of the foreign policy issues going on. I mean, analysts, for instance, write the um, articles that go in the president's daily brief. Um, the operations guys don't and mostly don't have access to that sort of thing. So, you know, it's a horrible day. Uh, you know, when an operations guy is found to have been a, a traitor, and it's an equally horrible day, but in a somewhat different way, if, uh, you know, God forbid, a, an analyst is found to have uh, been selling secrets to the Russians or whoever. And I want, I want to... Uh, so, no. sorry. No, uh, makes one thing which makes Russia so different uh, from the United States or other Western nations. And I recall an episode I was involved in in 1968, uh, the Soviets uh, moved into Czechoslovakia. I was acting chief of station here in Washington at the time, and I received a message from Moscow. Well, uh, tomorrow the Soviet troops will enter Czechoslovakia to crush the CIA in sponsored and organized and, you know, plot against the Czech Czechoslovak government. Well, I thought, Jesus, uh, I do not see any uh, American involvement in Czech events. But anyway, my mm, uh, bosses in Moscow tell me, show the message to uh, Ambassador Dobrynin, who was at that time, well, actually, he spent 24 years in the United States, too smart for Moscow, you know. So they kept him in Washington. So I do come to this uh, ambassador and show him the cable. Tomorrow, the Soviet troops will move into Czechoslovakia. And for the first time in my life, I said, fools. The ambassador looked at me and said, idiots. <laughs> so you see, you have to know the background of many things, not only from documents, but <clears throat> from real thinking of individuals who you are dealing with. That's really one of the most essential parts of the intelligence work. You, you know, let me uh, just endorse what, uh, what Mark was saying about the, uh, the potential of an analyst to have much, a much broader view of what intelligence is coming into the agency. In the operations side, there is often very, very tight compartmentation on sensitive operations. 
I mean, I, when I was a, a, a branch chief at a time when actually Ames was working for me, among other people, um, my own deputy didn't know some of the operations I was involved in. And that was all part of what was called compartmentation. Uh, when I first went into the agency and I wanted to go over to the DI or analytical side, uh, I had to go through an extra badge machine to do that because the analysts typically are looking at all sorts of information, which as Mark says, includes signals intelligence, which at that time was very, very sensitive. So I think you're, you're dead on when you say that. Now, the, the character Alex from the show, young analyst, brand new to CIA, may not have the kind of access that would make him a great age, you know, a asset right off the bat. And it makes me think of, from the complaint the FBI just did against the, the Russian spies in New York, they were trying to recruit people right out of college and young people. And of course, it comes to mind the, this adage that the Russians play the long game. The idea of recruiting people young so that if they're, you've got great potential, eventually they will reach a position where you can get some real information out of them. Is that, does it ring a bell when you saw this, Mark or Peter or even Oleg especially? Well, yeah. Oleg, go ahead. Uh, well, it does sound true to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, the, in fact, uh, years ago when I worked in the United States, well, and I had lots of contacts, I mean, official, semi-official, one guy who had some connections with the United States Communist Party, he was pretty old at the time. I mean, old, I'm 80 years old. He was 70 at the time, and I was a young man. And, well, I tried to sort of uh, collect information from him from the left wing, you know. He was, and he told me, Oleg, you know what? Uh, it doesn't make sense because the United States Communist Party has a direct line with Moscow, I mean, Soviet Communist Party. So why don't you meet my uh, uh, a relative, uh, so grandson? He is only 18. He may be helpful. Well, so I meet this young man, 18, can you imagine? Well, and I talk to him and I see he's a bride, and he said, I want to become a member of the Communist Party of the United States. I said, I said, listen, young man, this Communist Party is run by the FBI. Do you want to ruin your career from the very beginning? I said, no, I didn't know that. I said, well, that's what I tell you. Well, if you want to become a member of the party, let's do it this way. You will fill a form, give it to me, I'll send it to Moscow. You'll be registered as a member of the Communist Party, but that will be known only in Moscow. No one in the United States will know. I said, oh, really? That's good. That's how we started to operate. Well, at some point in his career, well, he landed in, in Moscow, indeed, but that was much later. <laughs> I, I would add that the CIA and, and the other intelligence agencies as well have, uh, what, for lack of a better term, sort of a breakwater against this, and that is that uh, uh, people with security clearances undergo reinvestigations every, typically every five years. So if you're a newbie at CIA, as Alex is, you'll uh, undergo reinvestigation after three years, um, and then five subsequent to that for very, you know, th this very purpose, that the theory is that you know, even if you're recruited the day after your reinvestigation was complete, you've only got a five-year spying career, uh, is the hope. Now, these reinvestigations aren't perfect, um, but on the other hand, um, while they occasionally weed out people who shouldn't be weeded out, they're also very good at finding people who should be caught. Um, so you know, that's, that's sort of an effort, if you will, to, to, to limit, you know, how, limit the maximum extent of damage and, and to some ways you know, thwart foreign agencies like the Russians who, who may be trying to play this, play this long game. I want to I ask Oleg the question I asked Mark earlier. Uh, how much, did, you, you did KGB counterintelligence in the United States, and you were actually the head of counterintelligence for the KGB at what, one point. How much did you know about your counterparts on the American side? I asked Mark, you know, did, as analysts, did they know who were the people that were, were spying in the United States for the Soviet Union or for Russia. Did you know the people that were hunting you? Did you know the people on the FBI side, on the CIA side, that were the Russian or Soviet analysts during the time that you were here? Well, we did know some, and I met them. I mean, uh, they were not necessarily Soviet assets, just, uh, well, uh, uh, relations of sorts, you know. Uh, but uh, sometimes, and this is uh, part of the intelligence uh, uh, craft, uh, you just milk the guys, uh, I mean, in the dark. They would not know what you want, but you ask questions related to some issues, 
which you know about, but they will give you some bits of information. And once, once just put together, you'll know the picture. That's how the intelligence works, actually. You don't have to have a source inside, but you may collect them. Well, in the old days, I had, uh, well, as a press officer undercover in the United States, I had great relations with some major papers and major, um, I mean, analysts, well, Christian Science Monitor, well, I can mention one of the best newspapers I worked with, I mean, with some of the correspondents at the White House. And they, well, well, they would share with me and I would share with them. By the way, I would provide them with information which would be, I said, don't ever mention my name. Don't refer to the Soviet source. Say some sources suggest and the rest. And that's how it happened. That's how it works in the intelligence business in my uh, experience at least. Peter, how much, how much did Robert Hansen hurt the ability to chase Russian and then, or Soviet and then Russian spies in the United States? How much did he give away the game when it came to counterintelligence? Well, I think the combination <clears throat> of Hansen and Ames uh, together, uh, they pretty well exposed most of the assets we had the Soviets who were working for us covertly. And as you recall, uh, we're certainly aware of 10 of them who were tried and executed. Uh, others uh, were not executed but imprisoned. Um, the, the compromise of CIA assets was enormous. So, and the other thing that, that I would add, uh, Mark touched on the uh, polygraph now, say with a new employee, a probationer, uh, being polygraphed after three years. The, the ripple effects of the Ames case were enormous. In other words, uh, the requirements for people to take polygraphs, the requirements for tighter background investigations and so forth, they were enormous. I cannot imagine what they are in the wake of the Snowden case. So those things uh, have tremendous effects within the whole intelligence community. We want to take the opportunity now to open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, we, we're going to have microphones since we are recording this. So if you do have a question, raise your hand. Jason, the dapper looking gentleman over here, will bring in the microphone and we start here in the front. Uh, hi, my name is Michelle Alexandria. I'm with Eclipse Magazine. I have two questions, actually. One, in the wake of uh, the intense scrutiny with security clearances, how does someone like Alex even get a clearance in the first place if his parents are Russian and they're Russian spies? Wouldn't, shouldn't someone have picked up on that? <laughs> I mean, I can start addressing this and then we'll kick it over probably to Mark yeah, at this well, point, well, or, or Peter. Yeah, what I would say is, and this is going along taking the program at its, its face value, uh, keep in mind that they were illegals in this country, they were not identified as KGB agents, and they also went dormant, I think, six years before the program takes place. So no one, no one would have associated them with the KGB or the Soviets or anything else. So when he applied, when he applied to the government and eventually the CIA, I think his background would have been very clean. Yeah, if I, could, I, I completely agree, and if I could just add to that, um, you know, there's some obvious advantages in having somebody who speaks Russian and who has some understanding of Russian culture, and, and you, uh, you see that in the show, and that's very real. I mean, there was certainly a time uh, in the 50s and the 60s where you pretty much couldn't spit in the CIA without hitting somebody whose family, at least, was from either Eastern Europe or, you know, Russia and the Soviet Union, um, and in a certain parts of the CIA, couldn't spit without hitting somebody whose family was from Cuba. Um, these days, um, it's, I think my impression is, I've been out for... Uh, 11, 12 years now, um, but uh, things are a little uh, more difficult that, that the intelligence community for, you know, its own security reasons is a little more concerned about, uh, you know, recruiting people who have families, say, in the Arab world, um, but, but historically, actually, you know, being Russian or being Cuban or being Polish or something has actually been, you know, a point in your favor if you're trying to get a job uh, in the agency or, or in the intelligence community more broadly. Well, and that's the trick. The idea is that you want people who have that background, who speak the language fluently, who understand the culture. And there's a balance you've got to, you've got to strike between somebody who could potentially have a background that could make them vulnerable you know, to recruitment. But if you get rid of anybody who knows Russian or has any kind of back, like Arabic is a great example that you brought up. I mean, after 9-11, if we got rid of anybody who looked Middle Eastern, then we'd be in big trouble. But of course, there's a possibility that you have a double or a mole in there. 
but you've got to strike that balance because you want people that are knowledgeable about area studies, that know the language, that know the culture. And the best people to do that are people that have the heritage. So you're kind of, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, but it's, if you want the best and the brightest, in the case of analysts, you definitely want the best and the brightest, then you may be willing to overlook you know, a, a Russian mother and a Russian family, or you may even embrace the fact that he has a Russian mother and a Russian family. By the way, yeah. you mentioned Arabic, and that reminded me of, me of my earlier career. I studied Arabic, and at some point I was supposed to go to, uh, uh, well, Egypt or Syria, well, and uh, just two weeks before my departure, I was at the personnel department. Well, that's a normal procedure. You know, asking how's your, I mean, any problems, uh, family, whatever. I said, well, no problems. And then he looked at me and said, you don't look like an Arab. I said, sorry, I do not. Well, <laughs> forget about it. You'll go to the United States. I said, really? In what capacity? As a Fulbright scholar. Well, that's how he came to Columbia University and, well, graduated from the School of Journalism. Mark, <laughs> that we was can, at 59, though. And to keep on this question, it's a really interesting question. I think historically, too, when Philby defects, and James Angleton took that not so well. James Angleton was the head of counterintelligence at CIA, and he went on essentially a witch hunt, a purge, of people who were highly intelligent in regards to the Soviet system, that Soviet native speakers and people that were Russian specialists, because he saw Philby everywhere. You yeah. know, and that, that's, that and it set the CIA back a decade, perhaps. Right, he was, yeah, among the, there were a lot of people who ran into serious troubles, uh, as, you know, because of Angleton and because of Angleton's paranoia, and I use that word advisedly. Uh, but yes, and they were certainly disproportionately people who had come from precisely this kind of background. And it was uh, a tremendously damaging uh, era in the history of the, of the CIA and of U.S. intelligence broadly. That, I'm sorry, it reminds me <laughs> of my former boss, uh, KGB, uh, so, well, uh, intelligence, uh, and at some point, well, by name Vladimir Kruchkov. Uh, uh, well, he was uh, later ousted and um, jailed, but in 1980s, I mean, uh, uh, well, just when Bob Hansen was already uh, working for the Soviets, um, uh, Khrushchev wanted to prove uh, to the prosecutor general and whoever that I had been recruited by the CIA or FBI when I was a Columbia University student. So. They could not collect enough information, so Hansen was approached, and he was asked, do you know anything? Oh, we have a lot of stuff about him, me. Okay, what, is there anything which indicates that he worked for the FBI or CIA? And Hansen, no, nothing. Okay, could you concoct, I mean, make a document, I mean, fake? And Hansen said, no, I will not do that. So I owe my life to Bob Hansen. Had he done that, <laughs> one minute, I would have been dead long time ago. The five minutes of Hansen's life that he decided to be honest right. and, and trustworthy was, was not to set you was up. something good, at least. Yeah. Uh, right over, oh. Oh, you're loud, sure. You guys know me. I'm Meredith. I work here in guest services. Um, She's a I plant. Just, yeah. Yeah, a spy. Um, anyway, uh, I just had a quick question uh, in terms of, you know, when agents want to defect to the CIA from the KGB or another organization, what is the process that you go like of vetting them to make sure that, you know, it's not some kind of power play? And, and how would you go about that process? I mean, would you actually meet with them in somewhere like a, a closed track at a subway station or something like that? How realistic is that? Well... <clears throat> The, uh, you're raising the very question that comes that's brought up by by the uh, by the program. You know, is she a dangle? I mean, that that's exactly what that is. Is this someone who's being run against us? Uh, we put a lot of time into um, dealing with that because throughout the Cold War, well, even now we have people who will come to us often in very strange places, saying, "I want to defect." And uh, often they will go to other people and say, I want to defect. You know, they'll go to a, a USIS library or something and say, I want to defect to the United States. And uh, one of the, th any intelligence agency confronted by someone wanting to defect will first try and assure themselves that this is a genuine, this person is, is genuine. And secondly, is there any way we can, we can keep them in place? 
Uh, you take the case of Shevchenko, which is Oleg is very familiar with, the highest ranking defector in the United States. Um, he wanted to defect, and we uh, persuaded him to stay in place for two years. He was the Under Secretary of the UN for Political Affairs. And so he worked as a source in place, and then later he realized he was being recalled because he had fallen under suspicion, and so then he publicly defected. Well, by the way, just uh, I was never a defector. In fact, when I uh, lived in Russia, I spoke openly uh, about reforms inside the Soviet system. I mean, political intelligence, counterintelligence, and that really uh, made me uh, a public figure. And that's exactly when, a, well, the former KGB leadership thought that I was working on behalf or for the CIA or whatever. And uh, I faced really serious problems. And then something extraordinary happened. Uh, since my name popped up in the media as a, well, sort of a dissident and uh, maybe a CIA agent, all of a sudden I was registered as a candidate to the Soviet parliament at that time, <laughs> where in the Krasnodar region, that on the Black Sea coast, a place which I, well, well was uh, in Sochi, I mean, a resort area, but I never knew anyone there, I mean. And all of a sudden I'm registered as a candidate I was amazed, and I ran, and I won, I mean, <laughs> and obtained immunity from prosecution. That's how things happen in life. So, Mark, let me, let me address a, a version of this question to you. As an analyst, what's the, f the problem with just taking in a defector? What potential pitfalls could you run into if the defector was, in fact, not legitimate? Right. Well, there's a couple uh, just immediately. I mean, one... Uh, is that this is somebody who's not genuinely defecting, who's been sent to us. Um, and if, uh, if we buy their story, we're signing up for you know, endless amounts of um, misleading information from, uh, from him or her that could lead us down the, the primrose path um, and, and potentially set us up for you know, just even bigger deceptions. Uh, the other problem is um, that this is somebody who's not been sent to us, but is just making this up because they want a visa to come to the U.S. or because they're slightly unhinged or you know whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, uh, the curveball case uh, would be—I mean, it's not a perfect example because that that source didn't come to the United States; they came to Germany. But you—but the the basic point there was, you know, in order to maintain this person's status, he was selling us uh, or selling the Germans all sorts of utterly false stories about the Iraqi biological weapons program. That is, that is the other problem that you face. Um, you know, the United States is a great place to live. Uh, lots of people would rather live here that, rather than where they're from. And if the price of admission is making up a bunch of lies about, you know, the, the, the army in my country or the intelligence service in my country or the, 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 the weapons of mass destruction program in my country and offering it at the nearest U.S. embassy or consulate, there are a lot of people who are more than happy to do that. And I would guess, uh, I never served, um, overseas at an embassy, but I would guess there's also probably a, quite a lot of people who walk in who are just off their rocker. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. You may, you, you may have thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to touch on, and, and this is getting back to the program, is uh, I did a stint with the, uh, well, when I was overseas, I handled a, n a number of our knocks who are equivalent to the illegals. Cover. That is, there are people serving overseas. They are intelligence officers. They're not under official cover. And this is the status of these folks here. They're not diplomats. They have no immunity. Uh, and of course, to save them, uh, the wife tried, was going to go to the FBI and just come clean and hope they could be resettled or something. The point I'm making is that living in that kind of mode, carrying out espionage with no official protection, is a very dicey way to live your life. It's very, and it is often tension-filled. Uh, it is often uh, difficult to deal with family and personal problems. Uh, I both dealt with our people as well as people who had lived, uh, and who were working against us, who had lived uh, that kind of life. So it, it, it's, it's not a game, and the stakes are very high. And so the, the, the premise of the program is that there could be people like this uh, I have no problem accepting. Just a footnote. 
but they would not be burned uh, as was shown in the movie. <laughs> The Russian services are more sophisticated. They would use <laughs> polonium for it. <laughs> but, well, the, in London, just at this time, right, they just another, reopened the case. Another yeah. course of the investigation yeah. it happened so many years ago. They are still investigating. Yeah. <laughs> there was a, uh, I don't know how many of you remember the Penkovsky case, but he was the GRU colonel who uh, had provided the information that enabled Kennedy and his administration to stand up to the Soviets over the Cuban, over the Cuban crisis. Um, he was publicly tried, there are photographs of it, and executed. And there were rumors that the form of execution had been that he was fed into a furnace. Uh, I never heard any confirmation of that or, or any other uh, rendition of the story. I don't know if you there did or not. There is a book by Suvorov, a former mm -hmm. military officer. That's where he tells uh, the story of burning. Well, listen, I you know, worked um, all my life in the Soviet Union and the KGB, and I never heard that. The, I mean, most sophisticated way I mentioned in London, polonium. <laughs> So radioactive isotopes. We, we'll, we'll still kill people we don't like, but we won't do it necessarily in such a nefarious manner. Um, what other questions from the audience may we have? All right, uh, let's go back there. To get. Hi, this is directed to all three of the panelists, and I'll preface this by saying uh, I'm sure that mistakes are very costly. I'm sorry, mistakes are very costly in your career. Can you tell about a time that you may have made a mistake and how you recovered from it or how you learned from that experience? Let's start with If Peter. you did make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're simply asking me to recall a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where to start. <laughs> uh, you have to remember, uh, keep in mind, intelligence is a very difficult discipline. Many operations do not result in success. So I think all of us can remember, all of us can remember operations that did not go well, uh, where we attempted to recruit someone and, uh, and it went wrong. Uh, what you try and do in intelligence is carry out, operation, carry out operations in a way that will minimize the damage. So that if it does go wrong, uh, you can either, you know, whatever the circumstances are, leave the country or whatever. So I, when you ask me to recall a particular mistake, I literally am not sure where to start. I mean, there, there's always a healthy dose of Murphy's Law when you're, when yeah. you're doing an operation that's as complex as most of these are. Something's going to go wrong. Well, and the best operations are the ones that can actually be adaptive and actually make something positive out of a bad situation, whether that's, that's true for intelligence, that's true for military operations, across, especially when you have this many moving parts as you're going to. Yeah, uh, from, for, from an analyst perspective, I can certainly think at least of one line of analysis uh, that I was responsible for that was just um, wrong from beginning to end. Uh, I probably shouldn't share it with you, and so I won't. <laughs> but what I would say is, and so I'm going to be an analyst, and I'm going to intellectualize my way out of this uh, problem in this question, uh, is that, and, I, and I'm actually serious about what, what I would say, is on the analytic side, um, it's often very difficult to tell when you've been wrong. So for instance, Let's say that I write an analysis that says that, uh, you know, um, next year thus and such is going to happen. It's next year this horrible thing is going to happen. So there's my prediction. So next year comes and this horrible thing does not happen. Okay, so there's a number of possible explanations. I was just flat wrong. Okay. I might have been right when I said it that, you know, the bad guys were at that time planning on doing this horrible thing, but they changed their mind for some reason or, you know, didn't come to fruition. And it might even be that this analysis that I wrote and that I sent off to the president and the secretary of defense and the secretary of state and all this saying, you know, this horrible thing is going to happen caused the U.S. government to do things that stopped it, right? So it might be, in fact, that, be, that the fact that my prediction didn't come true might actually be a sign of success. And as an analyst, I may or may not ever know which of those many possibilities it is. So, which You're is all by way. You grab on to the third one, no matter what. You yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so on. So on, on the one hand, uh, what this implies is that I'm sure that my analysis was wrong many more times than I know. But I also suspect that uh, that I also enabled all sorts of successes that I also don't know about. 
Well, and I think some of the hardest thing to do, especially from the analytical side, is the estimate. I mean, and sometimes the, the agencies are asked to predict a certain outcome 10 years out. Like, there, you know, there are documents that you find, you know, CIA prediction of the Soviet rocket forces written in the early 1950s, extrapolating out through the 1970s. 99% of that, historically, we look back and it's complete nonsense. And the estimates in 1985 of the Soviet rocket force 10 years out were really wrong because the Soviet Union ceased to exist if, like right. five years later, so. Well, one, just. Please. Sorry. No, please. Uh, okay. Just, again, so old memories come back. <laughs> Uh, uh, analysis. So, uh, at some point when I worked in New York as a journalist, uh, Radio Moscow, I met so many people, I mean, uh, from senior, I mean, Zionists, uh, well, Afro-American, uh, big, you know, shots uh, from Afro-American uh, community, and uh, I managed to establish good relations with all of them because I would try to, well, well just my, make myself understood and understand them at kind of a common language. One thing I recall, and that's why, I re uh, one uh, young lady at some uh, public event uh, invited me to come to her, you know, for a drink. I said, well, that's fine, sure. I thought she was interesting and with access to some U.S. Uh, government institutions. Well, I'll prove to be right, but at some point later. So she said, come at nine. And I thought, at nine in the evening? That's strange. Uh, it's the second time I'll see her at nine. So I came at eight, or about eight, just an hour earlier. She was stunned that she would keep me a drink, just a kiss or whatever. She was waiting for someone to come. But at 9.15, uh, someone knocked on the door, and I saw guys coming and I said, sorry, I'm leaving. Uh, later, I learned from the, well, FBI files that I was right. <laughs> she was working for the organization. But, you know, sense of uh, danger made uh, me safe from that trap, I mean, sex trap. <clears throat> uh, right here in the front, Jason. Uh, how has uh, intelligence gathering changed over the last so many years. Is it dramatically different than what it used to be in terms of, well, obviously you've got a lot more information to deal with, but also in terms of just the number of players that are out there running their own little shows all over the world? Well, the one thing you hear uh, the current director say, John Brennan, is we've got to get back to classic espionage. Well, that's right. And one of the things that's characterized uh, American intelligence, the intelligence community over the last, certainly the last 10, 15 years now, is uh, we really are providing very close support to the warfighter. So we're very, very closely associated with the military. And, uh, and we have installations overseas, like for example, Baghdad was you know, the largest station in the world. And you'd, you'd go out to meet your agents with a jeep full of security people carrying you know, weapons. Well, that's not classic espionage. Uh, I think there is, some classic espionage being carried out. I do think we've been enormously um, affected by the very close association with the military, which uh, was required at the time. I mean, in other words, we, we go where we're sent, as it were. So some of the uh, espionage of years past may not be carried out the same way. Uh, we became very, very good at carrying out operations in what we call denied areas like the Soviet Union and, and East Europe. And that was what was so devastating about having our agents rolled up by Ames and Hansen. If, if I could also add, um, I think we're in a period of accelerating intelligence collection capabilities. Uh, um, if you look back, say, oh, I don't know, 120 years, you could, you could argue that basically the only two real intelligence tools were the eyeball and the pen and paper, maybe augmented by the telescope and the horse, but that was basically it. Um, and in the last 120 years, we've seen the invention of, you know, just multitude, multitudinous uh, collection methods. I mean, even just in recent years, we have seen the invention from nothing of cyber collection. Um, and the um, and the flourishing of open source. I mean, open source intelligence collection used to consist mostly of listening to you know the main you know Radio Moscow and reading Pravda, right? I'm exaggerating a little bit, and now it's all of that. 
um, plus all the gazillion satellite television stations, plus everything that's on the internet, uh, and I'm not talking about stealing your, your email, mm -hmm. I'm just talking about reading Twitter and Facebook and all of that, which is tremendously valuable stuff. Um, and, uh, and so these days, in all seriousness, one of the enormous, enormous problems that uh, we face um, is too much being collected. Um, the volume is just enormous, and that problem gets worse every single year. Uh, so it's, 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 the, the change over the last century has been uh, tremendous, and the rate of change is, is accelerating. I mean, that's, that's been the classic problem. I mean, that's not a new problem either. I mean, the, 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 the question about separating noise or just junk from actionable intelligence has been a problem for decades. I mean, that's what a lot of historians blame the Pearl Harbor fiasco on. Now it's amplified many, 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 many times over because you have literally billions of collection methods from open source. I mean, Twitter feeds, again, Facebook, everything else. Now it's even harder to separate the nonsense from that one little needle in a stack of needles that can possibly give you information to stop the next Boston or to stop the next Paris or to find out what the Russians are really up to or to find out what Iran is really up to. I mean, this is, again, not just a needle in a haystack. It's just you're now dealing with so much information that finding that piece that matters is that much more difficult than ever has been before. Let, let me just give you a sense of that. So when I worked as an analyst uh, at CIA and before that uh, in the intelligence component of the State Department, so my normal day, and this was before cyber collection really was a thing, um, or much of a thing at any rate, my normal day, so I would come in at, I don't know, 8.30 or so in the morning, and I would have waiting for me um, something on the order of uh, 250 or 300 messages, so think emails, um, reporting raw information to me, and those were only the ones that were responsive to my particular profile that had, you know, keywords or concepts in them that I was working on, right, which was a particular slice of a particular country, right, and so 250 or 300 of those, and in the course of my, you know, nine hour day or so, assuming it was a regular day, I'd probably get another 250 or so. So I, as, just as a very first order approximation, I'm reading about 500 pages a day just to tread water. I'm not actually getting anything written or going to any meetings or you know, exchanging views with my colleagues. Uh, it's just servicing the inbox of raw data coming to me. And, I'm, I, and I was a tiny, tiny little slice with a you know, narrow portfolio of everything that's going on in the world. And things have gotten worse since. Uh, just yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I see uh, a major problem for the intelligence services today, over-reliance on high technology. Well, th this is understandable, and yet just one man inside may blow it everything, and no technology will help. One human source, that's enough. That's a perfect, perfect way to end this conversation. I'd like to thank Peter Ernest, Oleg Kalugin, and Mark Stout for taking the time out to be here today. I'd like to thank Alex for coming today. I'd like to thank everyone from NBC and everyone else who came here tonight. Welcome again to the International Spy Museum, and I hope you enjoyed the night, and we hope to see you again sometime soon. Thank you.